welcome you to our first of this year's series of uh, Lawn and Garden Talks. And uh, uh, I want to give a special thank you to the Master Gardeners that are here that were instrumental in helping to, to make this all go and put, help put this together. And these guys uh, really appreciate them and, and theirs. And uh, if you have questions about Master Gardeners or anything like that, ladies in the back, plus Marley up here, and these four, uh, it's all good, it's, uh, it's a good thing. To help us looking at uh, an exciting area or thing that, with plants and starting with plants, I guess some actually we are looking at past plants, a lot of this, uh, we're looking at heirloom plants, and um, John Siegel will, will uh, I'll let his here to share with us. Uh, his work that he's done with, with heirloom and neighbors, like he is, but, uh, mostly yes. Mostly, so um, please, please make sure that you uh, take in what he what he's got and um, um, ask your questions uh, as you go. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be real informal. If anybody's got a question, just blurt it out. <laughs> See if we can handle it. Uh, I think I was here about three years ago. Then he said, and I. I don't remember if that was the first time I ever talked, if it was uh, one of the first. I don't consider myself a real good speaker in public, but um, I kind of do this just to kind of force myself to do it. So, uh, I, I did this one in, uh, in Troy, and uh, Danny, I kind of apologize. I got your message last night late, but you know, I was going to call you. I don't, did Kathy call you back from the firm? I, Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, a guy called me by the name of Kermit and asked me if I'd come and speak to them. And, and, uh, and I didn't get any more notice from them at all. And, and, and uh, so I did show up that night. And when I got there, they handed me this paper. And uh, it said, with an abundance of tomatoes or varieties, choosing one can be daunting. We will listen to an expert speaker growing fabulous tomatoes. And I thought, boy, I'm off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the other thing, I guess, uh, somebody told me when you get 25 miles from home, you become an expert. <laughs> well, when I, coming down 127, I got to the landfill on the big rooster. Oh. It was 25 miles. <laughs> and I started getting smarter right there. <laughs> so, uh, we live up at Fort Army, but our store is in Covington, Ohio. Um, didn't know anything about heirloom tomatoes much before about 2007, 2008. Uh, I met a guy down in Covington, which ironically, his name is John Siegel, just like mine. Uh, we don't know if we're related or not. Uh, we can kind of crap that together. But we both went to Ohio State, same three, same four years. Both had three boys. We both was interested in gardening. Both had a herd of beef cattle, so we just kind of clicked. Uh, he worked with a guy by the name of Al Anderson. Al Anderson, back in those days, was a, a was on seed saver, which I'll explain that in just a second here. But um, uh, he sold seeds. John raised the seeds. I got involved, and we sold the plants. So it just kind of just kind of worked out fine for all of us. And I was telling Denny back in those days, I can remember Al wanted a certain variety of tomato. And he paid ten dollars a seed for five seeds. Three of them grew. But that was just our seed stock. I mean, you know, you grow one, then you then you can get your own seeds out of it. So so it was not as bad as it seemed, but it, it was back then that was a big badge that a lot of people with. And uh, I I looked up in two thousand and ten, that would have been about two years into this. We grew 376 varieties of heirloom tomatoes. In 2015, we dropped back to 257. In 2018, we were down to 145. And as of right now, I think this year we have 157, I believe. And we could cut that back. It seems like every time we cut out some tomatoes, it's always somebody's fruit. So, and. Uh, most, most of the people that come into the heirlooms, they're, they're, they're real, I mean, if we run out of something, we, we can 
he's gone and we put something else in. And, and they're real, they're real mendable about taking something to replace it. So, uh, uh, I think the heirloom business has kind of plateaued off a little bit. I just for this meeting, I did some research. I was going on the internet. A lot of the sites that I used to visit, some of the things I looked up, uh, are dated back to. I mean, I'm thinking I found something new that was built in 2018, 2007. But I, I don't think there's a lot of a lot of new stuff out there. I am a traditional heirloom person. Uh, there's a lot of people out there making new heirlooms and taking heirlooms and, and crossing them. Uh, there's a guy in California, I think he cranks out about 20 new varieties a year. They're heirlooms. I mean, they're over-pollinated, but uh, that's not really my game, I guess, is what I want to say. Uh, I like my heirlooms to be pre-1940s. Uh, the old, old ones, the, the name still means something. It's, it's not Brad Gates, Wild Boar, or something or other. Pork chop, I think. But, uh, so I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. Uh, uh, my wife is too, she's non-GMO, uh, everything. And we get in arguments all the time uh, about non-GMO and saving the world and feeding the world. And uh, my estimation, if we didn't have GMO crops, genetics, we'd probably all starve to death. The world couldn't feed itself. Uh, she don't like to hear that. She still washes all the grapes from the different grocery store. Uh, the, only, the only thing I, she can't answer me is she likes her non-GMO vegetables, but she won't give up her GMO sweet corn. <laughs> the old country gentleman and the white whatever it was, that pretty bland stuff. And I think we're on our third generation of sweeter sweet corn. And from what I understand, there's a fourth one coming out now that's really good. Really so, so, yeah, we. She, she don't want to argue that point. So, uh, one thing I will tell you now that this is a 2016 seed saver kit, and that's back when we bought in our hay. Uh, just for curiosity, I looked up the tomatoes in here. There's 67 pages of yellow heirloom. There's 38 pages of pink and purple. There's 97 pages of red tomatoes. There's 39 other colors. And there's seven what they call unsorted or they didn't get rid of that. So that's 248 pages of heirloom tomatoes. Roughly 30 on a page. So that means there's about 7,440 tomatoes in here that you could, you could just pick one out and uh, somebody in Iowa has that one, and somebody in Sweden has that one. And uh, th their address is in there, and, and they're available. So that was kind of like I said, that was kind of back in the heyday of the best. I think there's a lot of cross, uh, Carolyn Mayo, Mayo, Mayo uh, probably one of the forefront heirloom tomato specialist. She actually took the DNA of tomatoes and tracked it from the East Coast to the West Coast and it started out in Maine as Grandma's Pink and it got to Pennsylvania and it was Aunt Ruby's Pink and it got to Ohio and it was something else but it was all the same genetics all the way through. The name just changed. Now saying that, we have one of our biggest sellers is this thing we call Amish Rose. Amish Rose, if you look up the description in this book, says it come from a German uh, Amish lady in Pennsylvania, and it's got its description in there. There's another tomato in here called Rose. Same exact description, same lady. We grow them both. And they're slightly different. Even though the book traces them back to the same place, we, we kept them genetic separate for probably, oh, I don't know when we got, we had Amish rose for, for probably rose probably uh, the last eight, ten years. They are slightly different. And if I run out of Amish rose and I tell somebody, take a rose, I think they like it, they usually come back and say, I don't think that's the same. 
same point the same. Interesting story, the other John Single, he does a lot of the, John's a whole lot smarter than I am. John's, John's got the edge, I know, uh, new, actually. He just passed away a couple of weeks ago, but he has been growing Amish rose since way before I knew. And uh, I went to visit him uh, probably in October, and he was telling me about his tomatoes. He probably grew Amish rose for maybe 25, 15 years. Right in the middle of his Amish roses, is a yellow. Where it come from, there's no yellow in that index, no yellow. The tomato looked the right, the right size, the plant looked right, everything looked right, but right in the middle of, and John usually plants five of each. So he, 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 he's sure of not getting caught down here. But he said, I don't know where it come from, but right in the middle. <laughs> All these generations of Amish roses are, is a yellow. So that's, that's uh, I thought that was interesting, but uh, John couldn't explain it, but that's saying a lot. So John, is there, is there some thing that classifies or characterizes it as a heirloom? Oh, we, but yeah, I was going to get to that next. Uh, okay, that's fine. Um, heirloom tomatoes, back when we were here last time, I think the big discussion was, is it heirloom or is it heritage? And I still hear that number, that, that, that heritage around. Uh, I, I associate heritage more with livestock. Heritage hogs, heritage chickens. Uh, but I still see it crop up on the tomatoes every once in a while. But I think heirloom is pretty much standard. Uh, heirloom tomatoes uh, versus hybrid tomatoes. Uh, hybrid tomatoes are pretty much made commercially. They're pretty much one size. You've got the Romas, which is a paste tomato. That's one that's kind of an outlier. But most of your, your, your hybrid tomatoes are around baseball size or a little bit bigger. Uh, sometimes if you find somebody's growing the beef masters or beef steaks, they're a little bit bigger. But basically, it's one of those three. Heirloom tomatoes, we've got everything from, uh, we have one now called Mexican Midget, which is about the size of your little fingernail. And we have one called uh, uh, Giant Delicious and Brutus Magnus, which is a new one that gets five pounds. Okay, they're both red. You can just about find that any color. You can find that same spread in black, yellow, striped, anything from real little ones, green, anything from real little ones to the big ones. Uh, all are open pollinated, so it's, it, that's just that's uh, that's a give me. Um, the leaves, I think I think all the commercial tomatoes have got a regular leaf, but in the heirlooms you can find three types of leaves. They have what they call potato leaf and it looks actually we have one like this. Well maybe it won't. Uh it looks just like a potato. And a lot of the old German uh, tomatoes have that. Uh, does it make doesn't change the plant at all. It's just, uh, it's just uh, the type of leaf. It's uh, it's pretty dominant. Every once in a while, we'll find a flat of those, and we'll have one regular one crop up. I don't know where it comes from. We just take them out and pitch them. There's also a leaf called rugosi, which is kind of looks like it's wrinkled. It's uh, it's actually kind of pretty. Uh, looks like it's got a blight or something on it. And then some of these tomatoes, they have a real wispy. The, 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 the leaves are real small and they're fine and usually it's not a big strong tomato like a German tomato. They're usually kind of, I don't know, bland. So uh, as far as I know, you don't get those varieties in the, in the hybrid tomatoes. Uh, the disease resistance in the heirloom tomatoes is just about non-existent. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, put it like this, I wouldn't say it's not existent. Some tomatoes are a little bit more resistant to things like blossom undripe, some of the old problems. But if you look in these new books, these new seed books, they get, some of them's got a string of letters behind the tomato, BFA, NFA, I don't know what they all mean. You can look it up, it's blight resistant, it's this resistant, it's that resistant. You won't get that in heirloom tomatoes. Uh, I can't say in ours, 
we don't normally have that trouble. Some of them have blight problems. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in that real quick. We treat our tomatoes with a, with a product called Bordeaux mix. And uh, the organic people, you might know what that means. It's lime and copper sulfate mixed together. It's totally organic. Uh, we, sh we put it in a sprayer about every once a, once a week. We'll go out and just spray the tomatoes. And it is good for everything. We spray our pine trees at home. We spray uh, the, all of our tomatoes. Kathy puts it on the garden. The only thing, if, if it rains, you got to go out and you got to spray it again because it'll wash off. But uh, it's really helped a lot of things. Uh, and you can buy it two ways. You can buy it in a powder, which is what we used to do, but every time you go out, you just shake the thing up. Now they got it in liquid, so it's a chelated thing. You don't have to, don't have to mix it up. But boy, I tell you, just about anything that you want to put that on, it works. How do you spell that? B O U R B E A U X, I think. It's a French term. You went too fast. Uh, I don't know if I can do it again. <laughs> B O U R, I think, B E A U X. Uh, we talked about, uh, uh, I'll throw this in here uh, about uh, the, new, the new tomatoes because we do have some. Don't believe me, I'm, I mean, I'm not totally against it. We have some, several good ones. Uh, but John actually had a tomato he developed and he called it Gold Strikes and it showed up in his garden and he wasn't for sure what it crossed, but somehow it crossed. Tomatoes normally do not cross in nature. Uh, they're self-pollinating. Uh, John was a radical. John would plant five tomato plants. He put them in a row. He put them in a row 16 feet apart. He did it in his orchard. And he only kept seeds off the center tomato. That's pretty extreme. Uh, Carolyn Mayo will tell you in this book, if you keep your tomatoes about 6 to 10 feet apart, you're 95% of not having them cross, with the exception, you got to keep your cherry tomatoes away from them. They're, they're a little bit different animal. They can go 25 feet. So, so if you want to, if you want to save your seeds, in, in our garden, I think we space ours on eight foot. But uh, in our cherry tomatoes, we plant them in a barrel. We do real well, and we we get them way away from everything. Um, but John. Developed a gold striped tomato, he called it. And uh, <laughs> at one time, he was trying to stabilize that cross. Anybody knows anything about hybrids, you cross it while the next year you get one of this, you get one of that. You get two that might look alike, look, look correct. So at one time, John was growing gold striped ones, gold striped second generations, and gold striped third generations. And he finally stabilized it. And if you look that tomato up in the internet, they changed its name. Al Anderson went out to John's place one time and seen this tomato, it's a chocolatey brown with orange stripes on it, and said, boy, he never saw anything like that. And he took it to Cincinnati to a tomato tasting test. Well, Al left the tomato after he left and everybody divided the seeds up. <laughs> so it got out on the market before it was supposed to, but they did change the name. So if you ever see it now in the in books and seed catalogs and Several seed catalogs have it's called chocolate stripes. It's an excellent tomato, excellent tasting tomato. Oh, I think we talked about different colors. There's red, yellow, pink, purple, green, orange, white, black, brown, and striped. And different colors of stripes. Some are brown, uh, striped orange, or red. That's Yellow striped red, red that's got yellow in them. So uh, there's just a myriad of different colors. Uh, let's see if I missed anything up here. Uh, we have tomatoes in our store. It comes from Australia. We have a lot of Italian tomatoes. We have a lot of German tomatoes. Um, we have a few Russian. I try to get rid of the Russians because the Russian tomatoes are usually short season and pretty bland. But they're, they're I mean, if you want an early tomato, 
uh, purple Russian is, is the one you want. It's, you'll be two weeks ahead of everything else. But uh, when the other ones come, you can hurry now and get rid of them. <laughs> I never seen a white tomato I like, but I gotta watch for my single seeds. Some ladies take exception to me with that in the store. And uh, as a matter of fact, she told me we we only grew one white tomato this year. And I was just curious. I went back to 2010. We had white currant, white peach, white queen, white tomaso, and white zebra. So we had, I don't know, what was that, six, seven different kinds. And there have been other ones along the way. And my personal bias, I think. And, and <laughs> I, I'm that way on hanging baskets. Uh, I got flowers I like. If I don't like them, I don't sell them. <laughs> But yes, that's be an independent business when you can do what you want. <laughs> um, some of the things that we do at the store that kind of make us unique is we try to we get a lot of people, and, and believe me, the guy tell you, every year it seems like there's more and more gardeners coming out of the woodwork that don't know anything about gardening. I uh, had a lady in there the other day, and she didn't, didn't know what she wanted, and, and my first question to them is usually, what are you going to do with it? You know, are you going to slice it? Put it on hamburger? Are you going to can it? Are you going to can it? Are you going to make juice? Are you going to make salsa? I mean, there's, there's kind of a specific, different, narrow range for each of those, and uh, we try to get, uh, if, if they don't know anything about raising tomatoes, I sell them celebrities. Celebrities are jet stars. It's a hybrid, uh, pretty foolproof. They don't crack. You can you can forget the water for a week and you kind of you kind of suck it out. Uh, but your heirlooms, if you don't water them and it gets real dry, when you get a rain, they will crack. They they, they just they want to grow and they they'll crack more so I think than the hybrids. And the reason why that is is because the hybrids are bred to have a tougher skin. So that they can ship them to the grocery stores and they don't lose as much. So that is one problem that heirlooms have. Uh, Carolyn Mayo in here, she's got a whole thing in here. They got they, heirlooms like to do what they call cat facing. They get like bumps on them. Uh, they don't hurt the tomato. It just looks bad. Um, so so if we so if we can help the people find the right tomato, I, I mean that's kind of. It's kind of it's, it's counterproductive when you talk to five people. It takes an hour to sell eight tomatoes, you know. But uh, we had a lady call up one time, and she said, "I am looking for a specific Italian tomato." And she said, "Somehow they got her name. And I have no idea how it was, but it was Pantano Romanesco and Consoluti Genovese, and it's they're fairly rare tomatoes." We have, and I said, "Yes, ma'am, we do have that tomato. I, they're in our greenhouse, and ready to go." And she said, "Would you hold them till Saturday so I can get there?" And I said, "No problem. Where are you coming from?" Chillicothe. And I said, "Really?" And then she said, "Yeah." She said, "Well, we'll drive up on Saturday. Just make sure you got them for me." So sure enough, on Saturday they drove up. They bought two of each, and they drove all. And we have we have people drive. Uh, had two guys in there the other day was looking for a, a certain tomato which is black plum which I don't like. It's a salad tomato, and they were crab mackerel. I said, "How did you find this?" And they said, "Well, it, it, it's out there." We had a tomato called uh, Christina Vecina. It's a it's a uh, kind of a rare uh, Russian tomato that I like for one reason. It's a full season tomato, and. When we started our internet site, the lady put Seagulls Country Store. Inside the Seagulls Country Store, you could go to the garden section. In the garden section, you could go to the tomato section. In the tomato section, you could get a list of the red tomatoes that we grew, and Christina Vachiva was in there. 
And we had a lady call up and said, I understand you have that tomato. I saw it on the internet. Now that's like five feet from the internet. Uh, it, it's amazing. I, it, things happen every day. I can't explain. Um, we're winding down here. Anybody got any questions before I get to the one of your talks? I do have one. You were talking about watering tomatoes. Yes. I was always told that tomatoes uh, do better with less rain than when it rains a lot. So I have never over watered my tomatoes. I would water them, but uh, do they take more water than I really think they do? You know, I, I, I guess I think you're kind of right on that, but I think the key there is constant. You know, don't let them get real dry and then go out to completely soak them. Okay. I think that's a, I think that's probably the key there. Okay. Okay. Uh, cherry tomatoes seem like they keep that abuse a little bit better than the big big tomatoes. Okay. Um, we use worm castings, and I don't know if anybody's knows what that is. A few years ago, we had people around here trying to raise fish worms and sell them to the landfill, and the fish worm business went to shit. But the worm casting business is doing well, and it looks like ground coffee grinds. It doesn't smell. We put a handful in every plant we plant. Uh, these these tomatoes in about a week are going to hit the worm castings, and all of a sudden the color is going to get about three shades deeper green, and they're going to really get robust. I can see it, and I can walk in my greenhouse and tell when they hit that. And, and, and we just, when we do this, we'll, we'll put the dirt in, and we just put some in every flat and plant our tomatoes when we need it. It doesn't smell. I have a lady who uses it, tells me, she said, oh, she takes it, makes a tea out of it, puts it on her African violets. Uh, it's expensive. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't want to use it as a, as a fertilizer for a lot of things, but it's really good. And it's organic. Uh, and we sell a lot of these. Our cakes, everybody comes in and says, we got the best tomato from you last year, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> so our tags has got a hole in it, and it's for them to the computer. But I tell them, if you're going to cage your tomatoes, take a little bread wrapper, wire this right to the cage. You can still read it next year. Not this one you can't because this is a written one. But our computer, when it, when it uh, prints them off, you can actually read them from what you had in that cage last year. And that's really helped. Um, I've had guys call me on Christmas and try to decide what tomato you got out of this. And we figured it out, believe it or not. He said, you told me it was unique and, and, uh, and I would be impressed with it. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, tell everybody that. <laughs> but, but we did figure it out, seriously. Um, John, he, John, there's only one John Stevens. He was a purist. We get flat, 10 flats of tomatoes. And you're sliding them down and you're doing them. And if for some, some reason somebody forgot to tag this flat of tomatoes and we couldn't 100% identify it, John would throw it with junk. I mean, he was that adamant about, he was a true believer, believe me. But, John also would make the statement that he could pick 15 pink tomatoes out of our store, pull the tags, and none of us could identify them. And I believe that that's just how John was. And, and, but, but it had to be accurate. And, and uh, he, he had a tomato the first year he got it. It was called Bear Claw. And it didn't come up. And we got three or four of them. Three or four, not flats, three or four. And he brought them to me and he said, make sure somebody gets these tomatoes that you can find out how they did for them. And we put them in our greenhouse. And our greenhouse has got 300 flats. Of, I didn't find them for a month. <laughs> I didn't know where they at. Now, if you look at, if you go to our store and you see in this, we have our tomatoes and they're all in alphabetical order. And in our greenhouse, we have a stay every four feet. And every four feet, there's a number on the, on the rack. So if I look at uh, Amish Rose, 
I know it's in uh, row two. It's in it's one of the eight flats of tomatoes in that. And and that's the way we can but those three got stuck in the something. I finally found them, but that was John. Um, the other thing is a lot of people uh, one of the guys told me this, we have an orchard. Uh, boy, if you're ever gonna plant trees and you're gonna plant very many of them, have a log book. Because after four or five years and I'm getting older. I, I, I don't know when the trees are out there anymore. I gotta get my little piece of paper out and count the rows and say, oh yeah, that's what that is over there. And sometimes in our tomatoes, it's the same way. We'll plant usually about 40 tomatoes to save the seeds back. And we'll make a diagram, we'll put circles, and every tomato, even though we tag them, we cage them, sometimes between the, when you plant them and we cage them, the tag gets missing. Taken, I don't know that was still taken care of. But we can go back to our master list and identify that what tomato was planted in that spot. But it really helped me in my orchard. Uh, like I said, we got 30, 40 trees down there. And some of the oldest ones, I didn't do that, and we're still trying to guess what they are. So, uh, trenching, if your tomatoes get too tall, uh, don't be scared of them when they get this big. Lay them down sideways. Dig a shallow trench. Leave about the last three, four inches and bring it up on top of the ground. You come back next day, it'll be perfectly straight and it looks like it was thick. That's the way it was meant to be. Just remember that when you trench them in, trench your rows so that you don't cut them off with a rotor tiller if you're going to go to the next row or hoe them off. Uh, I get a question all the time about suckering. Uh, if you don't know what suckering is, uh, these tomatoes, every time a branch comes off of a tomato, but every time a branch comes off a tomato, there'll be a little sprout in there. And some people think that if you take that sprout out, you get a bigger, stronger plant. And some people say if you take that sprout out, you're just simply taking the green away from the plant that it's going to use to make food. Uh, if anybody wants to look at this book, this Greg Lahour is probably the best tomato book I have ever seen. And I got several of them. And even this guy comes out and says, it's a personal preference. If you think you want to do it, uh, he won't. He won't. He won't argue one way or the other. Uh, this guy also says, and we get this question all the time: low acid tomatoes. And his opinion is that it is greatly, greatly overrated. There's only a few, very few tomatoes that are actually low acid. Uh, most people confuse low acid and acidity with sweetness. And they don't necessarily go together. And the only two tomatoes that I really know I believe, that I truly believe myself is low acid is uh, Golden Jubilee. It's a yellow one. And there is one called Ace 55. And it is an heirloom. And the only reason I know that's low acid, we used to grow it because they tell me if you're going to can it, you got to add lemon juice to it because it ain't acid anymore. So that's the only two that I know that is actually low acid. Um, this guy in here has got his, uh, he's kind of like John. I tell you what I think, if you want to argue with me, John can argue both sides of the conversation, so, so you couldn't win with him either way. But uh, uh, the acidity thing, we get that question quite a bit. We also get a question a lot, do you have any tomatoes that don't have very many seeds in them? Uh, usually, if you if that is your big problem, if you take a paste tomato, usually the Roma type tomatoes, San uh, they, they they have fewer seeds. There is a few German Johnson, uh, German Pink. Uh, I'm trying to think. And the only reason I know this is because when we grow them, we try to get the seeds out, and sometimes they're virtually hardly in, and they're really small and they're hard to grow. So. Uh, 
Surprisingly, a lot of people are allergic to the seeds. Uh, I have one lady comes in, and she loves her tomatoes, and if she eats more than one every three days, she, her face breaks out. Uh, I said, boy, this could be a health test. Uh, I think I'm in, uh, about done here. The only thing I can tell you from personal experience is tomato worms are really hard to find in my experience. The big green ones, you have to stand there and look at them for 10 minutes and all of a sudden there they are right in front of you. And <laughs> they will eat up a tomato pretty, flat, pretty fast if they get on there. And for some reason I have that problem with my Missed anything up here? Uh, yeah, and how do you how do you determine which what seeds you're going to plant every year? Do you have individuals that call you and say, "Can you grow this?" Or do you have a list that you're going to say, "Okay, this is what I'm growing 2020." Actually, we do. And uh, in my opinion, and this this was my opinion only about four or five years ago, we missed the boat. In my opinion. Uh, we should have got in the mail order selling tomatoes. Uh, I took a buddy of mine that was in college, and I took a carton, and I cartoned him up 12 tomatoes, and we shipped them to him, and they got there perfectly, and I told my son and daughter, which also helps, they actually own the business now, I said, this is something you should be doing, and they never got into it, and consequently, we don't have people come from Terre Haute or, or Chillicothe anymore. You can go on the internet and buy the same tomatoes for, uh, they usually run anywhere from six to ten dollars, but they come right to your door, they're healthy, they look good. Uh, so, that was, I, I feel we missed that window. But, we actually get people now that call and want to buy seeds, and we haven't done that in the past. But this year, I, I, Teresa had like four people, a lady from Michigan wanted ten varieties of seeds, and, and several other people called, and, and so she's she's kind of doing that a little bit as a favor. The other thing is, we do get a lot of people bring us plants. I mean, you know, all the time we have yeah, at this meeting, a guy, a lady, did me a, her seeds from her family, and it was called Riverside, and, and it's a nice tomato, it's a pink tomato, and there's nothing special about it, but, uh, but it's it's a nice tomato. That's all I can tell. At the end of the day, a tomato is a tomato. Do you have any tips for growing tomatoes in um, containers? Big containers. Uh, I had a lady come in and told me, cherry tomatoes do great. Anything in the size of a five-gallon bucket or bigger. We get these We get these tubs, that, uh, they're actually uh, glasses tubs for cattle. They're about the size of a barrel, about that high. Uh, the, our heirlooms do real well in there. I don't think they do 100%. I think they do 80%. I don't think tomatoes get quite as big as they do should, and I don't think we get quite as many. But uh, people ask me, what's our secret to raising tomatoes? I don't need a secret. We plant 80 plants of tomatoes, and believe me, we don't need any more. So as far as getting big productions, that's not our goal. I mean, if I can plant a plant and get three good tomatoes off of it, that's all the seeds I need. Uh, one thing about seeds, though, and a matter of fact, I just did this. Uh, I went back through our seed inventory and I took five of our old seeds from like 2013. If, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, you gotta keep them seeds viable. Uh, when they get out there about five years, they get they get pretty shaky. Uh, I don't certain varieties. I, I don't know. They just don't seem like they grow very well. I planted ten seeds and these. Forty varieties that was old seeds. We don't grow them anymore, and uh, I got about seventy-five percent stand. I was impressed. Uh, I will take them and I'll plant them and I'll I'll re revitalize my seed. I have a new set of seeds, but but we have to each year. Matter of fact, we did that today. Teresa came out. We went through the seeds. What we what don't we have enough of next year? What do we plant? And we got to plant about uh, seven cherries and about thirty. Regular tomatoes to get our seeds up. So, um, so at and, the end of the season, then you go back through and look at your tomatoes and make a determination and, and say, okay, I want these for the following year, so I will cut these off and 
Actually, we did that already. That's what we did. Okay. Uh, after we planted our seeds, we look in the seed pack and say, uh, do we have enough seeds for that variety for next year? If we don't, we check it and we have to grow that tomato. And like Amish rose, of all these tomatoes, there is a bunch of them who grow one flat. 18 plants. 18, 18 plants. That's all we grow. Amish rose would grow 22 plants. So that's 22 times 18. That's how many. That is our biggest seller by far. Uh, Sun Gold, which everybody knows anything about tomatoes, you can holler at me. It's down in every room. It's our second biggest seller. <coughs> it is really good. Mexican Midget is coming up real fast. Black Cherry used to be a really big one. It's kind of hit the skids a little bit. Uh, and sometimes, we try to help, you got to try to help guess what the people want. We have a tomato called cow's tail. Okay? And for you farmers, if you know what that means, a cow's tail is big, and the Amish people, when they used to milk by hand, it was easy to get a hold of. And the German Baptist people down there have gotten onto that, and uh, I grew four flats of them this year. We're out, and we already going to get more of them, and it's funny because the German Baptists are funny, and I have a lady come up and she'll, she won't look at me, but she'll walk up and she goes, did you go to cow's tip this year? <laughs> and I say, yeah, we got them. So, but, uh, and, and uh, there's another one this year, uh, Grandpa Lugus German. Uh, I don't know, somebody bought that tomato, really liked it, and must have put it on the internet because it just exploded. We, we, we sold out of them already. The Clintox Big Pink used to be a really big one. It was an improved brand of one for to tomato. Uh, like I said, the whites, the Russians, I pretty much, I pretty much got because I'm Russian tomatoes. I, I, I don't. I, I mean, if you don't want to step on the, if you want a tomato and you want an early tomato, go buy an early girl. It's like 65, 66 days. And after you get your tomatoes, the rest of them come. You do what you do with the rest and just pull it out and get rid of it. Because it's 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 good tomato, but there's so much better. 80, 85 days tomatoes is for your, your money's at. So. A question on watering tomatoes, plants, once the winter is out, like how much the land still is going to be out. So the ground doesn't. Yeah, and that's a tricky question because I'll tell you, in our in our greenhouse, we don't use any a lot of greenhouses. If you go there and you see a tomato that this this big and it's got a stem on it it's about as thick as your finger, you can bet they put a growth inhibitor on it. I mean, they can get them up ten inches tall, stop right there. We don't do that in our store. As a matter of fact, when ours are taken off because they're hitting worm castings, there's a and, and we ask people, you know, how do you do that? Because it's so much easier. Because, like I said, we got a, when the weather's right and they hit warm castings, we got about a two week window and they go from here to here. And then we got to tell them, you know, you can trench them in or whatever. And, but one of the things you can do to hold a tomato back is limit the water. And we actually, in some varieties, Hold the water off of this side tomato until they wilt. And then you don't flood them, you just baby them along. And that, that will slow them down. And cold weather. The only trouble with cold weather, uh, they got a tendency to get kind of blue. And it really takes a long time for them to come out of that. So, but uh, if you limit, the, I don't know if that answers your question, but limiting the water and I, I got these barrels, I put my tomatoes in a case and I can get to drill a hole in them. And if you get a big rain and the water gets on them tomatoes and it just, it looks like you poured gasoline on them one day. They're, they're dead. And they ain't coming back. I mean, they, that's, they, they can't stand that. I, I think tomato plants are, are probably as touchy as anything we grow. Peppers, on the other hand, I think, we'll get them for two weeks and then just flood them. <laughs> I mean, they seem, they think, I think, but, you know, peppers are kind of like a dry, deserty type plant. I think, I think they, they, they like that. But, but tomatoes are, they're very temperamental, so. Um, 
Salts. Uh, I've heard so many things. I have a guy that when he really wants to raise a tomato for a pear, he puts a magnet on the stem with a rubber band. Oh, that's something else too. Uh, you see a lot about grafting tomatoes anymore. I mean, I'm not the guy to talk to, but I don't need the production. It's easy to do. I really don't know if if, if I can identify as like the apples. You know, you get. Crab apple roots are strong. You put them with an apple. The tomatoes? I think it's a gimmick. I think, I think that's some way that somebody gets maybe five bucks a plant out of it. But it's easy to do. You just wrap them up, take the paper from them, basically. Put them on and you grow. Tomatoes is a weed. You can't really kill them sometimes. Oh, that, that, that brings up a good point. One of the things I hear all the time is, especially with cherry tomatoes, oh, we don't need the cherry tomatoes. We've got thousands of them here. That's not a good idea. I mean, that, that really holds your disease over for a long time. Uh, we try to move our tomatoes one end of the garden, middle of the garden, next end of the garden. Uh, we, uh, we mulch around them so the dirt won't splash up in the leaves. When they get about two foot tall, we, we do take all the all the leaves, the lower leaves off that that can get water splashed up, lets air get through our rows. I think it helps quite a bit. But uh, uh, the Bordeaux mix will help that. Anything else? John, if you don't like Russian tomatoes, which are your favorite type of tomatoes to eat and vegetarian to grow? Good question. I like German tomatoes because they never fail. Uh, German tomatoes are usually uh, Brandewines, and Brandewines, believe me, Brandewines built this business. Uh, Brandewines is the first heirloom tomato that really uh, kind of broke through, I think in the early 1900s maybe. Uh, it, it's, it's a tomato that really kind of got heirlooms on the, on the, on the table. Um, but they fail me all the time. So heirloom sometimes, Brandewine sometimes don't get root through very free. The German tomatoes usually never fail me. If I got to eat one, it's an Italian sweet. I think it's I think the Italian tomatoes are a tick sweeter. Uh, I don't know, ladies, that can. Uh, they tell me the San Rosanos are a little bit sweeter than the than the Romas. I don't know if that's true or not. But well, we can, we can't everything. But I did find out one thing. When we can ours, we got to go out and, you know, we're picking tomatoes this big, we're picking tomatoes that big. And we got to bring them in and tap the branches them. And I usually got to peel them. And sometimes the little ones, the skin falls off. We got to pile them mush. The big ones, they ain't blanched at all, so I got to peel them. But when you're doing romas and they're all the same size, man, you can dial that water temperature down to about 10 seconds and you pick them up and just. So there is a really big advantage. They have all them tomatoes one size and ripe at one time. Indeterminate too. I, I guess I probably didn't even say that, did I? Almost all heirlooms are indeterminate. Means they never stop growing. Uh, we use steel fence for our cages. In the fall when we have enough tomatoes and they start growing out of the top, uh, the wind will blow them over because they get top heavy. Sometimes we just go through and prune them and let the bottom ones. And almost all of your hybrids are determined. It's kind of like strawberries where you have Juneberry and Everberry. Uh, the, the determinants kind of make the crop, get them all ready at one time. And your heirlooms will, will be blooming in December if, if we don't have a frost. So. But I did also did find this out. I don't know what makes the tomatoes taste good. But one year I cut a bunch of tomatoes back and put them in my greenhouse. And it was the exact same plant that we eat tomatoes off of all summer. And when we was picking tomatoes off of them in November, the world was good. 
<laughs> I think it's the temperature. I think it's uh, they, they need that 85, 90 day heat days to really make them taste good. Because, like I said, we ate them. And, and the other thing a lot of people do, I don't know if anybody does this, uh, you got to do it before frost, but right before frost, if you, if you got tomatoes, green tomatoes, red tomatoes, go out and cut your tomato off, take it down to your basement or put it in some place that's kind of cool and dark, hang it upside down. And they'll ripen. They'll, they'll ripen right there. You can just go down there and pick them off as they get ripe. They're not as good, but they're still better you can buy in the store. And the other thing a lot of people do is they actually pick them off wrap them in newspaper and put them on the shelves. And they'll do the same thing. Like I said, they're not as good, but cheaper. Tomatoes always amaze me. They never get cheap in the store. Tomatoes always $2. Heirloom tomatoes are no, <laughs> the only one that I actually can almost stomach even one that's that little Campari tomato. That ain't too bad, and that that purple or that brown one, that tomato. I ain't for sure what that is, but that's a tomato. Wow. <laughs> Anything else? John, do you have a do you have a internet uh, website? Store? Yes, we do. Single Covington Country Store, I think, will get you. And, and if they wanted to find you or find you about the store? Yep. Yep, it's on 36, uh, right in Covington, between Covington and Peckway, actually. So. And we're not a traditional greenhouse like Andy's. When we sell out, they'll close it up at about June. I mean, when we sell the last tomato and the last hanging basket, we're done. So it's not like Star where you know you can go in there all the time of year and find something. So. But uh, heirlooms has been good to us. You asked me. Somebody asked me about uh, if, if what we did. The other John Siegel was was really good in heirloom apples, and that is really really fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of heirloom apples out there. John has over 100 varieties in his orchard. And uh, uh, this is a John Siegel story again, but he, he found out that there was a subdivision going in at Lake Erie and there was an old orchard up there. So he packs up his little pickup truck, goes up there and cuts, they call it sky egg, or grafton wood, and takes it home, puts it on his trees. And, and they, he didn't know what it was. I mean, nobody, there was an old man owned it. But he got there before the motorists did, so and, and, and John keeps a little book. And he lost his little book. He didn't know what he did with it. But in his little book, you gotta go to row four, third tree from the back, four foot high, straight west, that branch is a certain apple. And, and the book was full of all of that. And he couldn't find it, so but uh, he was very good. Still have tomatoes left? Still left? Yes. Oh, we haven't hit our stride yet. Yeah, yeah, we're still planting tomatoes. You're still planting? Yeah. The canners, the canners, the two, the two gardeners. When we were in Fort Laramie, it was funny. And I, it, it, I mean, we're German. They're German. I, mean, I, I think German people are pretty unique. I think they, they take care of their properties. They're, they're thrifty. They, they uh, have pride in what they do. But in Fort Laramie, we sold. 80% flowers. Okay, geraniums, stamens, whatever. Not, not a whole lot of vegetables. Uh, in Fort Laramie, and I'm personally going to attest to this, the, my dad's home farm, when an apple tree died, they cut it down. They didn't replace it. it, it I mean, my grandma had apple trees in here, and she had pear trees there, and grape arbor over there, and uh, rhubarb over here, and, and as they and there's nothing there anymore. But down around Covington, everybody down there has got half a dozen trees. Uh, we sell buku vegetables, and, and they'll come in, but they won't be in until about the 10th of May. I mean, they, they ain't going to do that work twice. And they, so, so when you said about the tomatoes, uh, we're selling like individuals. When May 10th comes, we'll be selling flats. There'll be people come in and say, I need two flats of rovers. 
the one on the that's when the that's when the heavy gardeners come in. The only exception to that is when we're, we're cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. That's almost all gone. That's that's in the ground. Onions. My my comment is it's too early to plant the tomatoes. So. Yeah, <laughs> but it's full moon right now, right? Yeah. Okay. So what we always thought was. If you can pass the first full moon in May, you're pretty safe. So it's real early, so we're going to get past it now. I think there'll be another one until what, the 21st, 23rd, somewhere? That's pretty late for frost. So if there's a year that you can maybe get them out earlier, this might be the year. Last year wasn't. Last year it froze hard in Pepperton on May 18th, and I lost all my peaches. I mean, it killed me. If anybody wants to look at these books, you're welcome to come up and look at them. Like I said, if, you, uh, if you're really into tomatoes, this is the book, and you can find it in the back of uh, most seed books. You know, one thing that's really helped us with, the, with, the, with our store is when I was a kid, Mom used to get 8, 10 seed catalogs. And you got gurneys, you got, I don't know, starts, and you got turkeys. But now, these guys that want to buy one here and one there, it's like a $12 handling fee, even if you only buy a few seeds. So a lot of people are coming saying, you know, I, I, I'm just, they're, they're just tired of that. They just, they can't, I buy a lot of books on the internet. I think the books cost me $2. It's always six bucks to send them to me. They just drop it in. <laughs> And uh, Epsom salt, it's very touchy. You get your salt levels too high in the soil, and you, you become detrimental, especially to the roots. And the roots are what you want taking that out. And so that's a that's a very very close line that you have to play with there when you're using Epsom salt. So yeah. I wouldn't recommend. It. I've heard eggshells, banana peels. Yeah. Have to Fast acting line now that's much, much, uh, much better. And you got something here. Okay. One of the questions, and, and some of that what we're, we're talking about here leads to what we're looking at for next year, next month, uh, with Eagle Friendly Gardening. You'll get to hear from me. Um, pass the word. Uh, here's uh, about it. But uh, looking at things you can do to be Friendly with your I did bring gifts for you guys, and uh, uh, I don't know how Denny's going to give them away, but I will tell you what's in this. Cherokee purple, which is a very old heirloom. It's a great tomato. I have Pantano Romanesco, which is uh, an Italian tomato. It is, with a lot of Italian tomatoes that way, it's somewhat between a paste and a regular tomato. You can kind of go either way. You can slice it. We also have one called Fatso, and that is a new one, but it's a really good tomato. It's, a, it's kind of a modified beefsteak. It's big, flat, really cuts up well on a sandwich. It is red. We have Tidwell German, which is a really good tomato. Uh, very hearty, never fails me. Then we have Kellogg's Breakfast, which is a yellow tomato. Anybody wants a yellow tomato? And the last one is Pike County Yellow, which is, you've got, I think, a share of the Tennessee. So if you guys, however, he's going to give them away, that's a little history. Thank you again, and uh, yeah.